are live. Hi, welcome back, Craig. It's good to have you back. Thanks. Yeah, we missed you. Definitely some interesting things happening. <laughs> oh, yeah? Like what? Uh, I just uh, almost caught an alligator when <laughs> out with my son. Oh, better than an alligator almost catching you. <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe yeah. that happened too. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> where? So where were you when this happened? Yeah, so we were um, uh, camping with my son. Um, I think it was called Arapaho in North Carolina. It's uh, by the Noose River. Yeah. Oh wow, there's that's kind of far. That's like inland, right? It's about Ish. three hours from Raleigh. Yeah. I guess I wouldn't really expect an alligator to be there, but I see a lot well, of them down here in South Carolina. I don't think anybody Carolina. was. <laughs> oh. Especially at a camp with a lot of kids. <laughs> no. You yeah. said you have a video? Yep. I got a video and a screenshot um, or a zoomed in part clip of the video that I'll, um, I'll post. <laughs> okay. I want to see this. It's a was... six foot long uh, gator though. You told us it was 12 foot. No. no, it's not 12 foot, but it's big enough to eat somebody. <laughs> so. That's huge. Yeah, there's a couple eight foot be... gators around here, and it's like, stay away. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Blake? I was going to ask uh, how, how big it was, so you literally came in like right at, right at the ideal time. <laughs> and let us know the, the size of your feet, you know, how yeah. capable you are of handling an alligator. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I guess PTG keeps you safe from gators. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> we can always get into the gator, the gator security business. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get when you go fishing. <laughs> That's true. So. And um, something else that we, we want to talk about today that's maybe not quite as interesting for most people as catching gators. But compliance, <laughs> always a good Monday opener. <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to wake up and talk about compliance. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think you guys were asking about uh, compliance regulations that most people don't know that they're subject to. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Sure. So you probably it... all, all heard of HIPAA, which is for medical. Um, but I don't think a lot of people understand that there's two sides or technically three categories for HIPAA. There's what's called the covered entities, which is the doctor's office, the hospitals. There's what's called the clearing houses, which is the insurance companies. And then there's also the business associates, which is anyone that interfaces or interacts with the covered entity in any way, shape or form. And that could be your IT guy, your IT provider. It could be an accountant or somebody that has access to the books, but anybody that could potentially be exposed to the patient health information or PHI can be considered a business associate. And you as a provider should have what's called a BAA or a business associate agreement in place, which is a legal document that basically says that, hey, if you ever come in contact with patient information, you're gonna keep it confidential and you're, you have an obligation to secure it. So you are now subject to the same safeguards as the covered entity, so it's a trickle down effect. So that might be something that a lot of people are unaware of, that most people, when I talk to them and they have an IT guy that they're happy with, and yeah, Bob's been fixing our computers for the past 20 years, you know. So do you have a BAA with Bob? What's a BAA? <laughs> Didn't That's know a no. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So yeah, so there's uh, definitely risk and liability there. And if you get caught, then you can both be subject to steep fines and penalties. Um, so there's, that's, that's one common one. Another new one that came out is affecting CPA firms and, and bookkeepers. That came out in January of 22, which is this year. And that one basically is a similar regulation to HIPAA where there's safeguards and you have to have policies, procedures, and safeguards in place to make sure the sensitive information, the taxpayers that you're working with, you're keeping their social security number, their tax returns, and their books confidential. And you have security controls, supporting evidence, making sure that you're doing all this stuff. And it goes back to the same stuff that we've always been saying on previous episodes around risk assessments, pen tests, and all this evidence that are proving that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
And so just that, to, I just want to throw this in there. Sorry, but um, isn't it true that tax fraud, especially by cyber uh, or by hackers or bad actors, has increased over the years, especially with the advent of a uh, you know, a lot of people filing their taxes online. There's a lot of people that have their information stolen. I would imagine maybe that's one of the reasons. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously in a climate right now with uh, heightened risk and adversarial threats and, you know, hackers' favorite tools uh, in the toolbox. Uh-oh, I think I just lost Aaron. I'm back. Um, oh, okay. So um, what I was saying is that hackers really like uh, keylogger malware as one of their tools um, and keylogger malware capture any kind of keystrokes that are if you're not using keystroke encryption then the keylogger keylogger malware will capture all those keystrokes including social security numbers passwords anything sensitive so my point is that yeah the regulation they probably are starting to hey, look, you know, a lot of these CPA firms and bookkeepers are exposing consumer information. And, you know, we're, we're talking specifically about the new regulation that came out from in January of 22 that affects CPAs and bookkeepers and any of the, the, the uh, intermediate third parties that are involved with the handling of those sensitive tax returns and tax information or financial information. But, you know, there's also what's called FTC regulation. You know, Federal Trade Commission has federal laws around the sensitive data and the safeguarding of that sensitive data and like i said i mean you know we're in a different climate now a heightened state where everybody is really just it's a matter of time no matter what business you're in um, you're going to be subject to some type of regulation i guess the best one that most people are probably familiar with is credit cards and, you know we got pci compliance or payment card industry compliance if you take credit cards, you're subject to PCI compliance. A lot of business owners will not really understand that very well. They'll probably be outsourcing the acceptance of credit cards to maybe a third party provider like Square Payments or QuickBooks or you know some solution that they have purchased or that they use in their line of business. But the point is that when you use those solutions, you can't outsource your responsibility for the proper handling of the credit cards. Now, they may provide a good platform to keep that information secure, but you as the business owner and you as the business have what's called a merchant account, and you have an obligation and a responsibility to keep that information secure. Now, there might be a platform, like I said, that you have uh, that's out of your control, but if you read the detailed terms and conditions, there's typically things that you need to do and you need to what's called attest to and sign off on it. So what that means is that you, are, with, by allowing your business to accept credit cards, you have responsibility and obligations that you can't outsource, that you must do and that you must do properly and test and self-attest to and sign off on, hey, you're, you're keeping this information safe and secure. And that's why we keep talking about these assessments and these practice assessments and these pen tests and all this stuff just to make sure because you know we're all humans and we don't do everything perfectly every single time so we need help and we need third parties that are trusted to test all this stuff and you know hopefully catch it before an audit you know not all not all pci too is um is the same so like you said um using square does not absolve you of your pci compliance and obviously, the, or, the organizing body recognizes that. So there's four different levels of PCI compliance. So, for example, merchants that are handling less than 20,000 transactions per year are what's called level four. Um, and then it goes up to level three, 20,000 to 1 million, 1 million to 6 million, and over 6 million card transactions will be at a level one. So, you know, these are things that uh, obviously you have to do. Um and obviously, it costs you know it costs it costs higher to be a level one compliant than it does to be a level four compliant. So you know a lot yeah. of businesses there's, there's no excuse for sure. And as you go up that ladder, you know, using transaction volume, the number of transactions, as well as transaction size or average transaction size. If you like, let's say you're Ticketmaster and your average ticket sale is fifty or a hundred dollars. Um, if you do 10,000 sales in a day, 
you're obviously going to be on the higher level of your mandates around PCI. And they're not going to take, with that volume, they're not going to just allow you to sign off and say, yeah, 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 we're doing all this stuff. They need the proof. And there's actually a PCI um, certified assessor that will need to come out. And that's the third party check and audit that you'll have to go through in order to keep your business and, and um, keep the acceptance of credit cards at that volume and that average ticket size. Most businesses are probably smaller and they don't have that kind of volume or that average ticket size. So they'll allow you to have less strict um, regulation compliance and alignment. But the fact is that you can't outsource the responsibility and the, and you still, everyone needs to properly safeguard this information and you, everybody should have the mindset of, hey, look, I'm not only safeguarding it, but here's my proof. Another one that, um, that me and Aaron were talking about before we hopped on this podcast was obviously people that are doing business within the state or have customers within the state of California, uh, CCPA. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, so there's GDPR, Cal Europe. Yep, there's California Privacy Act. So CCPA, you know, there's also New York's privacy law. Um, there, you know, different states are now adopting their own levels of privacy and their own regulations that you have to follow. So you've got like these more recognized standards and frameworks like NIST. We've talked a lot about National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST. Specifically in the HIPAA space, it would be NIST 866. In the federal space or defense industrial base what, that we talk a lot about, that you know those folks are subject to DFARS and NIST and now the CMMC 2.0 compliance regulation. Um, you've got different frameworks, even small businesses. They have a, a framework for small businesses. They have computer information security. The FBI has CISA. You know, they, there's all these regulations and the, there's all these frameworks that are out there. Um, most commonly in our country, in America, there's uh, what's called SOC 2 Type 2 for a third party audit that an, a certified accounting firm can audit a, a period of time for a business. You, um, maybe your business is small and you want to do business with a larger company or a more mature organization. Those larger companies they measure the risk of the vendors that they do business with. So we have what's called um, vendor security questionnaire professional services, where we help a lot of those folks get through the maze of questions. And sometimes it's pretty daunting, 300, 400, 600 plus questions for the business profile, the small business to fill out, just so that they could, they could start getting on the approved vendor list to do business with the bigger guy. And when that becomes a, a daily occurrence where all these different companies are asking you to fill these things out, oh, and by the way, they won't allow you to rinse and repeat and reuse somebody else's questionnaire. They, they would not allow that. They, they make you fill out their own questionnaire and they make you fill out the evidence that goes along with that questionnaire. So if you're getting buried with all these different VSQs or vendor security questionnaires, you may want to consider a SOC 2 Type 2 or an ISO 27001 audit um, and compliance you know, framework because those frameworks will allow you to no longer fill those things out. And most large organizations recognize that a SOC 2 type two report or an ISO 27001 is very powerful. ISO 27001 is really powerful outside of America. SOC 2 type two is more common in America, but they are different frameworks. They're very similar but ISO is more of the global standard. So that, that's a way that, um, like I said, when the volume gets too high and it's really just, they're starting to bury you and filling these things out, that's when you would consider that. We can certainly help with those types of regulatory compliance. Do you think at any point things are gonna become more standardized? Like where yeah, all know, companies uh, are supposed to follow these rules? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that, um, NIST, NIST, has done a really good job of creating the, the, the new CMMC framework. And my hope is that more um, regulations will adopt that methodology and reduce the need for all these other regulations. Me meaning, you know, HIPAA came out and was signed into law in 1996 by Bill Clinton. So, I mean, that was ages ago. Look at, look at how much how different we are from internet and cybersecurity now versus 1996, right? 
So there's no clear um, guidance around HIPAA, so it's a very gray area. So CMMC 2.0, for example, could definitely overtake and uh, bolster and, and better secure our medical offices and hospitals if those would follow the CMMC 2.0 framework opposed to HIPAA. So it, I think in America, I think it's really going to be it's going to come out of the federal government and it's going to be a decision there on standardization. And I do think that that would be a good thing to simplify and help not only, you know, private sector, but also our defense industrial base. And if everyone, you know, is following that same framework, it'll make it simpler. And I think more people would actually do it. I think too, one thing that I've noticed, one of the biggest differences between HIPAA, uh, well, really CMMC and a lot of the other regulations. I feel like a big difference is that CMMC really focuses on trying to integrate cybersecurity into a culture, into the culture of the business, as opposed to just making a checklist for you to check off. Like they try to really get you to understand why you're doing what you're doing. I feel like I'm not saying they always win <laughs> in that arena, but I feel like the the thinking behind it is really smart and really uh, more up to date because the checklist approach is just not good enough anymore. Well, I think that's a good point, Aaron. I think the I think it's pretty obvious that checklists and self attestation is not good enough anymore. I think mm -hmm. that's really the whole reason why um, the federal government came out with the draft of CMMC version one, and basically the big change was. You can't self-attest anymore. You need these third-party audits, and you're going to have to find a C3PAO, and you're going to have to go to the marketplace and basically prove your compliance, right? And you know, when in November of 20, when the DFARS interim rule came out, and the federal government said, "Hey, look, we know defense industrial base supply chain companies that are out there. We know that you self-attested, but we want to really see who's really has the proof. Who who's." Who's able to upload their score to the spur system and you know how many of you guys of the 300,000 plus dip companies how many of you guys have a perfect score of 110 and you know I think that there's still companies on the sidelines that have still not submitted their score I think right. there's still confusion around well do I need to submit my score or, or does that apply to me and I think people are still not educated enough on the, the uh, responsibilities of, hey, look, I signed off on that contract. I took that money, but what do I need to do? And I think that people <laughs> forgot or glossed over all of the responsibilities. And that's where I think there's a lot of confusion right now with the DIB on, you know, what is the CMMC? Why do I need to do that? And then people get hung up on, well, CMMC is not really the law yet, so I'm not going to do anything. Well, most DIP companies already have a contract. And if you already have a contract, you're subject to the DFARS 7012, 7019, 7020, and NIST 800-171 mandates. And you've already signed off on it. So it's already been done and, in, and it is the law for over five years. So this is not new information. You know, there is, a, a, and I'm not trying to scare people, but there, the reality of the situation is the federal government does have what's called the False Claims Act. I know for certainty, that the audits have increased, the government is auditing more dib companies, and you know these people that are just sitting on the sidelines doing nothing are going to get caught, and then they're going to be in this this remediation period. They may lose their contracts depending on how bad the situation is. They may get um, penalties and fines. You know, it, so it's a bit of a mess. So I think that standardization would be a good thing. I think that third-party audits are a good thing. I mean, even even our company at PTG, you know, we have to get checked from outside third parties for our work to make sure because we're looking to mature and go after the CMMC certification ourselves. You know, so we're not just recommending our clients do this. Um, we're actually going through it ourselves, and I think that it's a good thing to have somebody check to make sure. I I've noticed too. Oh, go ahead, Blake. Sorry. Oh, I think this is a great opportunity to pick Craig's brain, and um, and obviously, so these compliance regulations are always evolving and always changing. Other than working with a firm like ours, 
um, what are some actionable steps that maybe a company could take to stay current and up to date you know having having a uh, I guess a rudimentary to stay current with what's changing because these regulations are always changing they're always refining them they're always adding new articles um, and we've had um, when I was working with another client of ours you know they asked me about that and I was like Good question, you know, because these are always changing. Like, so other than hiring somebody like us or working with somebody like us, um, how could you summarize that, you know? Yeah, so selfless plug is, you know, stay tuned to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe, (laughs) you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I mean, here's the reality. Um, We live and breathe this stuff, right? So, I mean, we're always getting the latest information, we're making sense of it, we're distilling it down. So where your shortcut, where your easy button, right? Um, but if you want to, if you, you don't want to use us or for whatever reason, I mean, the FBI, like I said, puts out CISA. Um, there's different federal, like I said, the NIST.gov website, National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST.gov. They have a wealth of information there. But here's the thing. You can go get all this stuff for free and that's great. But are you really going to be able to read and digest and understand a 300 page PDF from NIST that's very technical and even difficult for us to go through and simmer down and make sense and then translate that language to something that most people can understand? I mean, the information's all out there. It's all public, but where that shortcut, you know, we sift and sort it, we make it easier to digest. And then we, we, we help companies of all shapes and forms get started with this stuff. You know, they, a lot of companies can go to our website or they can go to the federal government resources and, and you know, maybe pretend that they're a defense industrial based company. It could be any kind of business. It could be a construction company. It's still a good exercise for that construction company to go through the self-assessment process for CMMC, for example, even though they might not deal with controlled unclassified information that's not the point the point is that it's a good exercise from a maturity standpoint to go through the self-assessment to identify all of the stuff the policies the procedures the security controls on all of your systems and get value from that because every single person and every single business is currently at risk from data exfiltration ransomware and other adversarial threats. There's all new evidence with the whole thing that's happening right now with Russia and Ukraine. There's new adversarial threats coming out all the time. So this stuff affects everyone. Even a consumer can go through the the free resources and bolster themselves. But, you know, it's kind of like diet and exercise. You know, who's going to wake up and actually do it? I've noticed, too, a lot of our clients, they don't have too much... Uh problems understanding what they need to do it seems like the biggest problems with them are implementing real world strategies that make them compliant well like i said you know nobody wakes up and says oh i'm gonna i'm gonna read this 300 page pdf today on NIST." and you know yeah they might have good intentions and maybe they'll get 30 or 50 pages of it read but I'm telling you this, I mean, I don't know if uh, the last time you guys have looked at this, but this stuff is really hard to digest, right? So I read I mean, it every day, Craig. I read it every day. <laughs> you know, it's it's, bed, it's bedtime reading, but it's got, you know, like I, I use the, uh, the example of exercise because I think it's a good analogy. You know, a lot of people, they want to lose weight and they want to be in better shape. So they buy the latest gimmick or the latest, buy into the latest book on, you know, the South Beach diet or whatever the, you know, the latest thing is or the craze. But they're in the, the psychological and emotional buying decision is I'm going to buy that thing, that book or that video series or whatever. But their mind is thinking when they make that transaction, that's the easy button for them to get the result that they want. But the reality is they learn really quick how much work it takes. You're not just going to get a six pack or, you know, lose all that weight without putting in the work. So my, what I'm saying with compliance and regulation is you as a business owner, you as a consumer, there's work that you have to do to make yourself better fit for cybersecurity. And the less fit you are, 
the more ripe you are for getting hacked or having your identity stolen. And I want to kind of add on to that too. Just like you know, if you get a physical trainer or a personal trainer, or if you get a gym membership, just because you get those things or buy an entire video, you know, collection of yoga or whatever, mm -hmm. you you still have to do the work, even if you have people to guide you. So working That's out. Right to lose weight or to get into shape with your cybersecurity. You know, we are an easy button, just like a personal trainer is an easy button. They can't do all the work for you, but they can show you how to do it. Yeah, like so, for example, staying on kind of the fitness thing, <laughs> um, <laughs> which because I think it's it's easy to understand for most folks. You know, like you ever see like the Weight Watchers commercials where, you know, you, you get all the food and you, you get our meal plans and everything's all kind of laid out for you, right? Mm -hmm. All you got to do is eat it <laughs> and then go do the exercise. So so with our ComplianceArmor.com security training, for example, and our policies and procedures, we've done all of the hard work for all of you guys. 80% we get you there, but you still have to do the last 20 because we don't know what kind of business you have. We don't know all the details of how you'd like to do business. Th those fill in the blank answers are for you and for you only to customize and tailor this solution that we've created for you that's, like I said, 80% there. So we've done as much possible work that we can to get you there, but you need to get yourself to the finish line. Now we'll still be your personal trainer in that, and you can hire us for, for consulting and professional services, and we'll give you that accountability and we'll be that that shoulder to lean on for questions and you know how do I do this how do I do that and then we'll meet with you at a cadence that you can you know afford as well as that support for your time and you know we'll we'll get that work done with you and we'll help you but ultimately it's your responsibility you're the one that's signing on the dotted line for that self attestation or if you have a more modern regulation you know you're the one that's signing off on that contract to get that contract award it's ultimately your responsibility and then I had another question for you, Craig. Um, and Blake and I kind of touched on this a little bit last week, but what do you think is something that the US government could do to help get everybody into cybersecurity and understanding the importance of cybersecurity hygiene or what like, even just for the dib, right? What are some things that you think the government could do to help CMMC sort of quicker, like started more quickly. Do you know what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, yeah, good question. Like, so I, I, I've said this before. I think that the federal government has really good intentions, and they had great intentions mm -hmm. when they came out with the beta of CMMC 1.0. In my opinion, I feel like they diluted it and really lowered the bar to CMMC version 2.0. You know, 1.0 had five levels, 2.0 has three levels. I think the, the, I think we have a great framework right now that we can further fine tune and customize. I think the problem right now, the, the big missing puzzle piece is we're not getting enough support from the federal government around this is what you need to do by this day and time. Mm -hmm. And this is what's gonna happen after this day and time. Like I'll give you a perfect example. When the DFARS in our rule came out on November of 20, they said, look, you need to upload your spur, your score for your self-assessment on NIST and DFARS. It's a negative 203 to a positive 110. You need to do this by December 1st is what they said. And then they said, if you don't do the upload and you don't have a perfect score, you have six months of POAMs, plan of action and milestones, which is basically, I'm gonna fix this gap, this is how I'm gonna fix it, and this is the day and time it'll be fixed. And you're gonna get yourself that perfect score, score of 110. But here's the missing piece. The missing piece is they say that you're not gonna get that contract renewal, and they say that, look, um, you know, you, you, you need to show evidence of this stuff. But I don't feel like there's enough clarity around that. I feel like it shouldn't be this thing, this distant vision in the future. It should be, look, you need to do this and you need to do it by this day and time. You know, we'll, we'll put it two years out or a year out, or whatever the time frame is. We need some day and time that this must be done from, and direction, clarity from the government. Look, January 1st of 23, 
everyone needs to do this. And if you don't have this, you don't get to participate in the supply chain. Or, you know, they need, we need more substance. More teeth. They need yeah, teeth. more teeth. Yeah. <laughs> like really bite yeah. into that. And, the, and I think the same thing for health, like I said, with HIPAA and these other regulations, you know, why not just take this as the opportunity to say, look, if you're a business and you're, you're handling any kind of sensitive information, consumer information, credit cards, birthday, pay, you know, personal identifiable information or PII, any PII, let's group it all together. Any PII, PHI, anything sensitive, right? If you, by January 1st of 23, you have to be this level and if you're PHI, then you may, you need this other level. And if you're CUI, then you need this other level. My point is, let's have a framework. Let's choose CMMC 2.0. And let's say, look, you if you're a business, if you want to take a credit card from somebody, you have to do this. And if you don't do it, you can't take the credit card. And this, I think that we need more teeth in it at all levels of any type of business. And the same thing with consumers. If you want to go on the internet and you want to buy something from a merchant, just like if you want to go and you want to drive a car, it's a privilege to have a driver's license. Maybe it's a good idea to have a cyber license. If you want to go on the internet, you're going to have basic training and you're going to be audited and tested and you need to renew it every so often to make sure that you are being responsible with your information online. Now, that yeah. also kind of goes back to something Blake and I were talking about. I'm sorry, Blake, um, where we had the idea, and he, Blake said that he talked to you about this too, about starting with cybersecurity young, you know, like in elementary school kind of thing. Now, out of curiosity, I don't have children. I do have lots of nieces and nephews, but I'm just curious, are there, do they have any classes like that? Like in their computer classes, do they teach any sort of cybersecurity lessons? Um, I, my children are too little right now to be able to comment on that. I, I do know that I have been asked and have done many continuing legal education and many continuing education for medical and for other colleges and universities. I did a lecture at North Carolina State University a few months ago. So I, I've been hired to give good information around cyber and compliance. Um, I don't know what the quote unquote basic training is for younger kids. Um, I think it's a great idea and it should be baked into the program but I don't know what the curriculum looks like for that. Like I said, I think that, especially for young kids, like I'll give you an example, like with Facebook, you know, and social media, you know, there's all these documentaries out there around how the our youth and our smaller and younger kids are getting subject to all these different things like TikTok, for, and I'm not just calling out TikTok, I'm saying Twitter, or everything, you know, Facebook, you name it, fill in the blank, social media it has some damaging effects for, you know, growth and emotional, um, it, just all these damaging effects that, and I'm not singling out any of these providers. I'm just saying, I don't think that these providers really knew what these effects could be. Right. And I think right. that we, we all as a population in society have probably had damaging impacts from mobile devices and just computer, you know, there, so there's like positives and negatives, right? Like, so computers are great to get things done, but you know, maybe there's what's called addiction with, um, mobile devices, you know, and then there, you know, it's a real thing, you know, there's detox of, of, you know, cutting the cord of your phone and constantly checking for notifications and things like that. My point is that I don't know what the curriculum is, but I think that that's a great idea. And maybe there should be some federal program that creates a uh, almost like a NIST, but a NIST for kids, right? Yeah. Like a framework for that, where look, if you have a kid that's this age to this age, you should complete this level of education. And maybe it's an online kind of course, right? And, and who knows, maybe we'll create it, you know, because we have a university uh -huh. too. So, so that's a good idea that we could create. But my point is that whether it comes out from the federal government, I think that there should be guidance around that and kind of best practices to best educate the, the youth and the young. I think especially with something else Blake and I talked about, um, you know, especially with like social engineering and, and things like that, because there really are real world consequences. It's not just, oh, it's just Facebook. No, I mean, you know, even look at, a, what was it, Craigslist? I mean, they had 
people going around like killing other people like this you know what i mean like we really need it i feel like we got too big for our britches in a sense in that you know we are really quick to uh really take up the internet but we weren't quick to think about we didn't really think about the consequences right so now we're seeing the consequences play out in the real world and to me, it seems like, and actually since Blake brought this up, I've really been thinking about it. I mean, the biggest solution I see to this is start them young. You know, you said your kids are too young, but I mean, they have, I'm guessing they have, if they don't have phones, they probably have iPads, right? So they touch, they touch. Well, actually my, so- my kids in particular, they don't, <laughs> we don't allow them to use the device unless it's kind of supervised. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, yeah, so yeah. You know, we have, we have, uh, we don't just give them the device unless we're like in the car on a road trip or something. We don't really give them free reign of a device. We, we have, you know, measured time with our kid. We're, we're strict with that stuff. Well, and I'm not saying we're perfect either, but I do think it's a good point. But here's the thing I think this stems from, you know, when the internet came out, it was kind of like this anonymized, um, area in quote unquote cyberspace where Mm -hmm. anyone can kind of go and, quote unquote, surf the internet in, in uh, anonymity, right? You know, right. but I think that now, you know, and I, I, I'm a privacy advocate and I think that, there, but I think that there should be two sides, meaning I think that if your purpose on the internet is to, like I said, there, there should be some responsibility at the consumer level, but what if we had followed the quote unquote driver's license responsibility thing? And what if in the future, the government said, look, if you want to use the internet, you have to have your license to quote unquote surf the internet. And it's no longer a private, it, you, you know how we have like IP addresses and, and things like that that, I, that we get from our internet service provider? Well, what if one day that we all had assigned our own number, kind of like our social security number, and that was our identity online? Wouldn't it be interesting to look at it through? I'm not saying that I'm advocating for this. I'm just saying that just kind of go through the journey with me. What if everyone had their own IP address and identity online? Don't you think that would kind of have an impact and effect on cyberbullying, for example? Definitely think the internet would be a safer place. I mean, if everybody, like if, if if your IP address was always the same and everywhere you went, you had fingerprints of you. it's you, right? Um, don't you think like there would be it would be safer, like Blake said? And you know, if 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 I have an identity or a, a static IP address that identifies me or my child, and then there's cyberbullying happening, and there's supporting evidence that you know that okay, that's this kid, right? <laughs> you would think it would impact that. I would think so. Yeah, yeah, I would think so too. I mean, you wouldn't be as if if somebody knew if somebody had access to everything you said and everything you did online, you know, you would probably think about your actions a lot more than if you could be anonymous. Yep. Very much so. You know, and who knows and who you know, maybe the blockchain, who knows, maybe the blockchain could Web record 3.0. that or Web 3.0 could kind of be that ledger so to speak but my i I think it would be interesting though like if we use the driver's license example you know if you drive a car you have to have a license you have to pass the test to get the license but you still have freedoms it's a privilege to drive the car right but you still have freedoms like if if you want to break the law meaning speed you can but you have consequence too, right? So like right. If, if you think you're not going to get away with going 80 miles an hour in a 55, you, you have the freedom to do that. But if a police officer, you know, scans you with a radar gun or laser gun or whatever, and, or, you know, finds that your car is the one that's breaking that law, they're going to pull you over, write your ticket. So what if, what if we had an internet that was kind of like that in the future? That could be interesting. Yeah. Our, our, our two big ideas were, so obviously like when I was going through uh, high school, they required that we take two languages. One of them obviously that too, yeah. English. And then I, I think I opted for Spanish. 
But anyways, what do you think is more useful in my world right now? Obviously, not only because I'm in cybersecurity, but I mean, imagine that if if, if cybersecurity was required curricula in, in these in these schools. But not only that, me and me and Aaron were talking more from a, a younger, more adolescent age, so we had the idea it's like okay if, if your child is, is old enough to run an application or, or to choose whatever game they want to play on the tablet for something as simple as saying okay little johnny click on this application before you click on your game and of course that that first application would be a vpn or some you know something along the lines to to create some you know, some well, it should be degree. it should be kind of like the rules of the game. In that context, it should be the rules of the game, right? So, like, if you want to excel um, and get to the next level, you have to abide by the rules. If you don't, then you don't get to the next level, right? So, it should be kind of like a almost like a rewarding point space system. Mm -hmm. our, our 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 second big groundbreaking I, I don't know maybe groundbreaking, but our second big idea was. So obviously, if you think about this before you buy a car, you know, you you have a Carfax, right? So thinking about a Carfax for a business. Okay, before I go to this business and give this business my money, here is their health, their score card. Here is their Carfax. Um, yeah, I actually came can, up with that um, several months ago, I, a cyber Yeah, score. I think. I think, yeah, I think we were talking about, yeah, we were talking about, I don't know where it's stuck in my head, but, you know, it, yep. it, it, it really, to me, like, is an idea that makes so much sense. Well, it makes so much sense. It, it helps things to become standardized, you know what I mean? Like, if you want to get insurance, you can do all of those things at once. Like Craig was talking about, you have 17,000 different forms that you have to fill out to say the exact same thing. Well, if yep. you have this the cyber score, cyber credit score, whatever you want to call it, I mean, then it's it's just right there. Also, what I was thinking about when you guys were talking about, um, I don't know, something earlier, but like I feel like if they if things were standardized, then companies are going to be more apt to do kind of like what Blue Shift is doing and what other companies, vendors that we've worked with are doing, which is mapping what they like their the controls that they can provide to whatever compliance um you know whatever regulations are required so you know if you have like one standardized cmmc for everything right i mean every single vendor that we work with is going to be like oh, wait a minute let me figure this out for you guys right so i can get it would just really well, help that's what i was saying several together. months ago um sorry i don't yeah you're good you. I, I was just saying that um, when I thought of that scoring thing, that's where I was. That's where I was going. I was saying, look, mm -hmm. if everyone would just standardize on like the CMMC, and let's say you know the the your score ranges, or, you know, from a negative two hundred three to a positive one ten, that could be one way to do it. But but then we started talking about it, and we were like, maybe it would be better not to use numbers like that, and maybe we, it would be better to just do A, B, C, D, and F, right? Um, so that could be a way, but. We, you know, we have the resources and the, the technology to help people increase their score. Um, and I would love to see in the future maybe adoption of our methodology around the scoring system because, I mean, look at it from a risk profile. You know, if you're an insurance provider, do you want to insure somebody that has an F or where your risk of paying out a claim is exponentially higher? Or do you want to give the guy that has, or the girl that has an A on their score, maybe they get a break on their insurance because you know that your likelihood of a payout is extremely low. Right. I can, I can already, I can already imagine it right now with the uh, the Petronella browser bar, you know, <laughs> yeah. where like whatever, whenever you type in ah. like a dot com, it, it tells you like A plus, B minus, da da da. So, yeah. I mean it. It's kind of taking like the previous idea with um, you know our, our our current scorecard idea and bridging the two mm -hmm. uh, because you know once you access the website, okay, they got a B minus. Okay, how how why do they have a B minus? Like how do they handle data? You know, 
okay, here's how they, here's how they scored, and here's why they scored a B minus. You know what I mean? Yep. And, yeah, uh, and here are some it, solutions it, too. It's easier. It would be easier to find solutions for them. Yeah. As well. Oh, if you want to, if you want to use this website, um, I was thinking more like in a broader scope. Oh, if you want to use this website, we highly suggest that you, uh, you know, use a VPN or use a keylogger or da da da. You know what I mean? Things of those nature. Well, it, you know, what comes to mind too, ironically, is is food labeling. You know, like you go to the grocery store and maybe you have a gluten allergy or a wheat or a, you know, peanut or a tree nut allergy. You know, right now with the the way that things are labeled, it's a mess. I mean, even with food labeling, um, there's cross contamination. Um, the labels are not clear. So. Not only do we need work and a score in cyber, but we need it in other things like food labeling too, because it. I, I think it would just be a positive impact for for everyone, right? I mean, I think that, like you guys said, you know, what I came up with with the scoring thing. I think these it would bring clarity. I think it'll bring much needed clarity for folks, and I think that if businesses had like a code of conduct to adhere to, or maybe the, the government came out with some more guidelines around it, or maybe there's in, you know tax incentives. Like, look, if you have a better score, we're gonna give you a break on tax, you know, some, some type of positive um, impact from, and support from the government I think would be helpful too. But I think that some type of global recognized, or at least North American at the beginning, and then a global recognized standard is much needed. You know, now that you bring up the food industry, and I, this is just my understanding because I've watched some of the documentaries on Netflix that talks about the food industry, the, the processing, these huge slaughterhouses, and yada, these mega monopolies that have people uh, sitting and acting in government that are making legislative decisions in favor of them um do you feel like that's the case for cybersecurity? do you feel like our cybersecurity uh hygiene on the government level has been stalled by uh by things like that uh, or, or has it not yet creeped into our industry yet that's a really interesting point i think that um my opinion <laughs> is that everything's affected by that stuff you know like like you know i'm, I'm not going to get political but you vote for you exercise your right to vote to trust that the person you're voting for has alignment with your values and beliefs right but there's no guarantees that they actually do what they say right and a lot of them i'm stereotypically speaking when i say this but when a lot of you know elected officials say one thing in a campaign and then not do something else. My point is, I think that, like you were mentioning, Blake, there's certain foods that have, you know, uh, monopolistic behavior, certain companies of certain sizes. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, one thing I'll, I'll reference with the CMMC, you know, there was a lot of pushback from the little guys, the DIB, the defense industrial base, the smaller companies in the supply chain. The, there was a lot of pushback uh, around CMMC, NIST, and DFARS in general saying that it was going to be too expensive and cost prohibitive and nobody would do it. And then, you know, they would say only the big primes would do it. Well, if you think about that for a minute, you know, our company, PTG, we, we found ways that the, to help the little guys, to, to make it affordable. And it really is truthfully affordable to get these scores at a level where your small business can compete. Does it cost money? Absolutely it costs money. Is it um, millions of dollars for most? No, it's not. Is it um, a fraction of a cost of your contract? Yeah, you know, it's definitely a cost of doing business. Um, and we believe that it's a uh, almost like a minimum effective dose to be able to quote unquote get your driver's license to be able to, to bid on these contracts, right? But Absolutely, I do agree that big companies uh, often persuade or or um, influence, for sure. Absolutely. Now, what if I, think, I mean? I feel like the government couldn't they give grants like 
I feel like that would make sense. Like right now we have trillions of dollars exfiltrated, you know, trillions of dollars in data exfiltrated by bad actors, you know, and, and enemy states basically. So to me, it would make more sense. That, I mean, these things are not free, unfortunately. I mean, it takes time and it takes money, even, you know, if you do get a cybersecurity firm. So I guess I kind of don't really understand. Although I guess in the past, the cost of NIST has been kind of built in the contract, right? And a lot of people just haven't used it. Well, but it's not the cost of NIST, really. It's more about, um, I, I view it as, you've got this foundation of your business, right? And with NIST and DFARS, you're attesting that you're gonna do the NIST 800-171 stuff, right? But right. Sad, sadly, I would say that most people don't even know what they signed off on, so they don't realize all the stuff that they were supposed to be doing. I don't mm -hmm. think that it was necessarily baked into the contract. However, I think that it should have been, before signing off on it, it should have been evaluated by the business owner or the stakeholders around, look, if we want to go after this contract and this contract's worth $10 million, we need to realize that it's going to take us X dollars for to be able to um, fortify our systems and get them up to speed just to be able to get this contract. It's, it's again, a cost of doing bit. It's an investment from that DIB company to be able to then have the access on these opportunities, these new opportunities. And I think that the challenge, especially with the federal government and, and politicians, the challenge is how do we keep freedoms in place and choice without being biased? And I, and I agree with that. I'm not saying I want to be told I need to do something in a specific way, but I think that that's also where there's the big confusion point around mm -hmm. some of this and where people don't know where they can get started. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I just, I feel like if they would just make a big cybersecurity initiative, you know, and like really push it yeah. and grant money to people, to businesses, all of the businesses, not even just the dip, right? I mean, if we want to really well, get it doesn't even security... have to be grant money. What, what if it was just a tax break? Credit. Yeah, well, that's We're going to give you, you know, Businesses get crushed. Our own business gets crushed with taxes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice if, look, you get your score to an A, you get X percentage off on your taxes to help, you know, with that pain and that burden, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that could be a good idea. I, I'm in favor of grants, too. Um, but I think the point that I was trying to make is I don't want to be told that I have to do it one specific way because, the landscape's constantly changing. You know, we want to make make sure that innovation continues to happen around XDR and other layers in cyber. And we want to make sure that we have the choice as a business owner. We have the freedom to choose one vendor over another. Um, obviously, we we negotiate on our clients' behalf better deals for our clients. So that's why it's selfless plug. Good to go through us. Um, but the truth of that is that we we truly have vetted and tested these things. That's why we, we really, that's part of our mission and our value to make sure that we are that easy button for folks. But that's why we do that. And that's why for the past 20 years, we work on not only making those good relationships, but making sure that the stuff that we partner, that it actually works. You know, there's so much stuff and so much money that's wasted and so many promises from a good salesman or a salesperson or a saleswoman that persuades the the company on the other end, oh yeah, yeah, this is gonna make all your CMMC or HIPAA or whatever the framework is, all your worries go away. This thing, it does it all, it's the silver bullet. But then, you know, there's companies that truthfully are out there that will take your money. I mean, I've heard all sorts of horror stories from small businesses just getting ripped off. And I, I think that if there was more teeth in it and more direction and more clarity around these frameworks and reducing the amount of frameworks that we have, maybe down to just the CMMC or whatever the, the whatever they want to call it, that would make it simpler and easier to understand for people. And like you were saying, Aaron, before, there's you know a lot of crossover, different mappings from one regulation to another. You know, we're all trying to say the same thing and, and one one um, author of one framework might want their their framework to be the global standard or whatever. And that's all great, but I think that if it comes from like the government, like the like the CMMC, for example, 
I think that could be a good clarifying moment for a lot of people. And, and then let there be freedoms and competition in the marketplace around here's a solution for this. And again, it goes back to the labeling I was talking about, right? So like if our vendors, Microsoft and um, you know Apple, if they all were regulated and subject to this framework and they all were better able to label their products and say, oh, this, this product is gonna meet access control domain and give you X points on your spur score and you know, make it easier, label things better to make it easier for, for consumers and businesses to pick and choose products based on how much of a score impact they'll have. I think that would make things so much easier for a lot of people. It really would. You, you missed our podcast. I, I don't remember. I think it was last week, but I just, I feel like this is such a good thing to bring up at this moment, but um, I think Aaron, it was our statistics podcast podcast, sorry, um, where we talked about percentage of your revenue that goes to security. Yeah. Like, 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 so let's just say you're, you're a freelancer or an independent or, you know, a, a self-contractor, you know, once you get a check that comes in, you know, you take a percentage of that check and you put it aside and you lock it up in a vault saying, Hey, this is for when tax day and the tax man comes, comes knocking at the door, April 18th. You know, so you have a reserve set aside. I think if, if I can't, uh, if, it, if it comes to mind immediately, I think, Aaron, I think it was around 6 to 11% of your of your revenue should be dedicated for, for IT, cybersecurity, things like that. It just depends on, on, you know, the data that you possess. And obviously it's going to be more if you're, if you're, you know, a government contractor um, or maybe less, to, you know, if you're, you know, selling blankets at the flea market, you know, or so that's something too that I think, you know, people need to understand. And then I even found um, a deeper diving article, you know, 50% of that should be operational and infrastructure security. Um, another 20% should be vulnerability management and security monitoring. Um, another 16% should be government risk and compliance. Uh, and then obviously this one would be, you know, unrelated, but ap application security. De of course, this all depends on the sector. Um, but that stat to me, I mean, just, I, you have to do it. You know, so I, then, then there, then there's a call. Uh, sorry, I was just going to I think that you're, that's really good. I, that, I like that. But I think that, um, people and businesses need to understand that there's a minimum foundation, a minimum effective dose, that whether you're one person or a thousand people, you have to have this minimum foundation, okay? And then as your complexity increases with regulations or sensitivity of data, then you have to ha have these add-ons, right? So maybe like Blake said, you know, you have these increased percentages, but there's a certain foundational be a strong foundation that needs to be in place for every kind of business first and foremost. But I think it really goes back to the labeling that we were talking about, right? So like if, you know, I think it's great that every business should have X percentage put aside for this stuff, right? But I think it goes back to vendors and putting pressure on Microsoft and other vendors to better label their products and services so that we know, hey, this is a, a puzzle piece or this is a contender for giving us X number of points to solve this, this problem in this domain. And there, you know, again, it also goes back to responsibility of the, the, the end user, in this case, the business owner or the consumer, the person using the product to properly configure those things, right? Like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they all have these platforms in their cloud services environments and they all have a lot of mappings that are already done. But again, you can't outsource that responsibility. So you, they're giving you the environment, but you or a professional on your behalf needs to properly configure and continuously monitor and police that environment, make sure things are, are buttoned up and you know your scores stay high. But my point is that I think it goes back to labeling. Like I'll give you another example with CUI or controlled unclassified information. You know, the federal government in the training that we all took for the CMMC from the CMMCAB to be registered practitioners and 
and to, to be an RPO company to help these people, the defense industrial base clients, as well as other businesses of all shapes and forms. The training that we took basically said the federal government is still working harder to better label and identify CUI. And if they did not label something CUI, you need to treat it as sensitive and secure it. So my point is that there's so much work to be done with labeling of, of data and all types of sensitive data in all industries, in every single one, in health and in federal space and you, you know, you name it, fill in the blank. My point is that labeling needs to be improved on everything. The regulations need to be simmered down into a more global standardized system and there needs to be more teeth in it. And there also needs to be more full integration of cybersecurity. I, like, I, I don't know, ever since learning so much about CMMC, I, that really resonates with me. I feel like instead of having cybersecurity and IT kind of off to the side is like, you know, just out of sight, out of mind departments unless needed. Like it just, it needs to be a part of the corporate culture. And speaking on that, Blake, um, I want you to guess, I just found this a statistic. I want you to guess what the average, and you can guess too, Blake, I mean, Craig and BJ, <laughs> guess what the average company, what percent the average company spends on cybersecurity of their total revenue? Well, I think it depends on which sector, like if it's finance or banking or whatever. Um, it is, but uh, you're asking for a dollar amount or a percentage? Percent. Oh gosh, it's probably less than two percent. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say around one. You guys Maybe half are not. A percent. That's closer, Blake. Point three percent of point revenue 3%. is generally what is spent on cybersecurity, and we wonder why we have so many hacks. Right. <laughs> you know. Think about because this. Think about this. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, you didn't. Oh, okay. Well, so, so think about this. When you go in and incorporate your business, whether you're using like legal Zoom or e-file or, you know, insert service here. And then as you're incorporating your business, you know, there's all these free services or like add-on services. Oh, I want Bank of America to reach out to me. Oh, I want a CPA firm to reach out to me, yada, yada, yada. Why is there not a cybersecurity service there? So that way, you know, like Craig was saying, you're building your house with a sturdy foundation because that's the that probably the, the, the thing that's on the back of a startup's mind. Hey, how do I follow compliance? How do I be secure? How do I secure my customers? You know, it's like the groundwork isn't even laid. Of course, you have more things to think about, like being like like profitable and generated revenue and cash flow and all these other things, administrative responsibilities, but that should go hand in hand with those. And it should still be a part of your, your core uh, foundation of your business. Start and focus on cybersecurity while you're, you're bringing all these other pieces together. Right. And it's so much easier to start it from the ground level than it is to incorporate it after the fact. And I think maybe it's, that's, it's way more expensive. It's way more difficult. It's so many more challenges. Do it later. Yep. Yeah. But do it later. So it I, I, absolutely agree. I agree with that. And, and the service exists. I mean, we created it. Right. So, I mean, uh, it's, it, you know, we're that easy button for businesses and consumers to help them with all this stuff. So, so we exist, you know, to help the people and, uh, you know, provide really good, efficient services that are, have high value, high impact and high security. But the, what's lacking here is the teeth and the federal government side around standardization and labeling. You know, if more people knew about us and, and how affordable some of this stuff is and how, you know, um, how easy we make it. You know, I think it, it's just going to be better for everyone. But, you know, 0.3% is obviously not enough um, of an investment. And sadly, you know, we don't create all these solutions. We just know the right recipe and the process. And that's why we have a, a patented cyber safety stack of over 22 layers now. And, you know, we have that stack because it's so powerful. And we continue to, to, to build on that stack because it works. And we know that 
it's it's battle tested, you know, and we only use products and services that are battle tested that go through our process. So my point is that um, if we get more support from the government around standardization and labeling, it's going to make it easier for everyone and more clear for everyone to understand why they need to take action now and not just sit on the sidelines. You know, what's interesting, Craig, is that um, as we've talked about before, because we, we're we we're always a big advocate of using the right strategic solutions. And we've talked about XDR a lot. And what's interesting is recently Gartner, who, you know, kind of is the trendsetter, right, for cybersecurity reporting. And they're, you know, definitely considered an authority in the field. And the government probably reads their reports and kind of, you know, I'm sure that they're a source of, of a lot of, um, you know, determining what what action government and business alike takes. Well, recently Gartner published a report um, with with a statistic, um, um, basically a you know an expectation um, where Gartner says that they think within the next couple of years that XDR adoption will be at least forty percent. Now that is a big number. Wow. <laughs> that is a really big number. Like cool. when you really think about it, they're not just saying four. They're saying forty percent of all businesses, guys. Like that's a huge number. Well, what's really interesting here is that. I think that finally things are going to start to settle and sort themselves out in the right way. Because if you just look at this as an example, like just our ecosystem, right? Like Petronella Technology Group, like Craig has worked painstakingly over the years to stay in the know on the most important aspects of cybersecurity from, you know, building bulletproof PCs years before the world was ready for the idea to always um, vetting all these different technology solutions. Well, now again, Craig has put positioned us in a situation that's, you know, very um, significant because we actually work very closely with a certain XDR solution that we feel strongly is a very good one. And, and we're involved in research and development on the machine learning side of this solution. And after, you know, because I have it in my home um, as part of the research and development project, and I have had to spend so much time, right, documenting anomalies um, with this system in my home, like to the point where like, like a lot of time has went into just observing what's happening in my smart home. And how, because this is a, this is the unknown territory that we're in now, because XDR is an AI driven cybersecurity tool that partners people and technology together because the people have to input the knowledge into the tool and then the tool, you know, analyzes and, and then takes action. But we've positioned ourselves in a, in a, in a unique spot where we're involved in the actual research and development of this tool being used in the, in the real world, you know, like in a smart home, for example, and I'm noticing some things that I didn't expect to, to, to observe, you know? And so I think that Gart, it's so significant when you add all these little pieces together and you kind of paint a picture in your head of like where this is all going. If Gartner is saying 40%, and that's just on what we know today, that's not factoring in all these anomalies that I'm that I'm documenting. Like something's something's happening with the, with this tool. Like I, I have pages and pages of documentation of things that I'm noticing. And so 40% could be low. And so this is a, a, a very important time, a shift in cybersecurity where the people that are have been on the cutting edge, because we wouldn't be involved in this, in this process with this XDR tool if we weren't consistently on the cutting edge of cybersecurity, you know, where we always find ourselves. Well, now I think this is really going to start to be um, a pathway for people to just what Craig was talking about, finding the right solutions and being able to onboard with them and taking the stress out of it. Because, you know, if XDR, why is Gartner estimating 40%? Like that is such a big number. So they have to have their suspicions about the X factor here, the machine learning part, right? And we agree with that after what we've witnessed. So this is such a critical time to partner with the right people who have the right knowledge and the right expertise. And they have their hands in the trenches with their sleeves rolled up because this stuff is uncharted waters, <laughs> you know, and 40% Gardner, is a big number. Gardner is also the publishing authority that said that you should spend anywhere from six to 10% of your revenue on cybersecurity and IT as well. They're the same publishing authority. I said that. So I just want to throw that in there. 
Yeah. Like, I mean, people, companies pay, we know this, like Gartner's like the authority on this. Like they, people pay big money to try to even advertise on a Gartner report, right? Like to get in the limelight with Gartner. Um, if Gartner, what I'm saying in a nutshell is that Craig has made very smart decisions and has put us at the cutting edge of things that no one even knows. No one even knows what to expect. Right. Cause me, I'm like an anomaly hunter. Right. And I have been so surprised at some of what I found. It's hard to surprise me when it comes to this stuff, but I have been floored by some of what I witnessed and like to the point where I get so excited, my hands are shaking. Right. As I'm trying to document this stuff, cause it's that fascinating. And so like, and they're saying 40% without knowing those things is my point. So there's a pathway that's probably just going to self form. Right. But you have to be aligned with the people who have been there working on this because that's just the way it's going to work probably. And so, you know, I think that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, and I think that we're always going to need the right cybersecurity people because, you know, these tools don't, they, they need the human interaction as well. The human interface, like it's very important. And, and these tools don't work right if they're not handled correctly right with the right expertise the right knowledge like you know what i mean like i wouldn't even but see sorry to interrupt you but see a lot of people don't understand that though a lot of people think that oh i'll just go buy this off the shelf xdr and then the salesperson does a great job of selling them on you know it's the greatest thing and like i said before it's not a silver bullet it's a powerful layer and it's an essential layer these days like we were just saying 40 percent is a great stat for adoption. But my point is that a lot of the solutions do not have the cybersecurity talent managing that hardware and software and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. And that's where our solution that we chose comes into play because it marries all yes. that together. And yes, it, because it, what it marries together is the understanding of this stuff and the foundational layers, the backbone of this stuff, because what is software, right? Like software is how can, can ask anyone to define what software really is. And people are going to think they know, but as they start trying to define it, they're going to get very confused and they're going to stumble because what is it? You know, what is, what is AI? What is machine learning? What is AI driven cybersecurity tools, right? Like good luck trying to define all that. But the key here is that because of the years and years and years of cultivated um, knowledge, right? About these things. Now there's a level of awareness, right? Amongst certain people in this industry where they know what to pay attention to and they know what parts of the software need attention because in a scientific process, the observer is critical to the process. And so this is a, a very, we're in a very unique time for cybersecurity teams and 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 it's not ironic it's not it is ironic excuse me it's not coincidental that a few months ago the government the federal government went on a huge cybersecurity talent hunt like literally i saw the solicit solicitations being emailed out like they're searching for top cybersecurity talent because i think people are starting to understand that the the people involved in the cybersecurity teams definitely have an impact on how the tools work well, not only on how they work, but how to, you know, just like in anything, the, you know, the human is going to use the tool in the toolbox and then hone their craft, right? So there's going to be some people that are better at it and some people that are not. But as I listen to what you're saying, BJ, I think that we need to create our own Gartner report. <laughs> and yeah, reason, really. The reason why I say that, no, I'm being serious. The reason why I say that is because, you know, I like Gartner and again, I'm, I'm not, you know, putting any reports down in any way, shape or form. But even though Gartner is, you know, well respected, I don't think that it's fair to charge vendors or or people to be on the Gartner report, right? To kind of pay to play kind of thing, like right, we're right. talking about, you know, with the the other industries that you kind of have the top big players that kind of control everything. I feel like there should be a report that we write that public that gets published annually or whatever the frequency is that's not biased. And it's just objective, yeah. It's objective, yes. Like it's that presentation you gave, you gave that presentation at a university and it was the perspective of the observer. And and yeah. your presentation actually was sent to me by Google Assistant, right? But it's really good. It's really good. It put things in perspective for people. And that is so critical. And we've seen even, we've seen companies 
go with the cheapest solution or the, you know, the one that is offered by a big tech as part of a package deal. I personally don't suggest doing that because this oh. is unchartered waters and that's not how this stuff works. <laughs> this, the, these tools, these smart tools, they work differently. <laughs> they, they don't well, work. And that's, that, that's also why we follow that proof of concept methodology and we back everything up with third party evidence too. You know, yeah. but, what, but here's what's alarming though. What's alarming is the statistic of folks, businesses that don't understand the value of even the proof of concept. Right. You know, and we've even seen people that are like, oh, yeah, well, we didn't really budget for this. So we'll look at this next year. <laughs> yeah. That's the wrong approach, folks. Yeah. I mean, you need to invest in this now. And I mean, if, if you're not hacked. Also, if you have an active attack going on on your computer. Well, well, yeah. I mean, well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, if you if you don't think that you've been hacked, you probably have been. You just probably don't have the visibility and the technical understand the human side of it, right? The human side to see what you know. It's kind of like out of sight, out of mind, right? If you don't see any red flags or you know um, any evidence of something wrong, you're thinking, oh, everything's great, but when you get that visibility and you look through that lens and you see how, look, there is something bad happening and this is what's really happening. This is how, here's the, the mitigation and the remediation plan on fixing it. More people need to go through those proof of concepts. I, I just don't understand. That's what's mind boggling to me. Why most people, you know, more people need to invest more and take this more seriously. Yeah, it is, it is mind boggling. The, the, you can see, I can clearly see in my interactions with with people i can clearly see that there's basically two sides of this all like there's the people that get it and understand the complexity of cybersecurity and the strategy of you know people process and technology and the right ones the right people the right processes and the right technology because all three are important right well, it's really just about important. how they're aligned and then some people don't get it at all and they're like oh i just i literally got an email from someone and they said, literally, they're just going to go with the lowest price. And I'm like, I don't know a nice way to say this, but that's not the right way to look at this. And well, you're making and a very big mistake. You know, there's always a reason why that price may look cheaper. Right. There's something it's, missing. You know, right. That, it's a it's a rinse it. and repeat. Hey, we're going to launch this tool, but we're not going to we're not going to pay it no attention and observe it. And it's not going to really do anything phenomenal. It's just going to be there as a as a you know, you're going to be able to check a box and say you have it. But how effective is it going to be? You know, I mean, you can build a house with one guy and a hammer. But yeah. if you don't have the miter saws and all the latest technology, right, it's going to take you a really long time to build that house. Yeah. So, so we're not saying you can't go and find your own stuff, but I challenge everyone listening to be more efficient than we are. We work yeah. hard every day to find the most cost-effective, efficient solutions that actually work. And I guarantee that you will not find a better recipe than what we've developed. No. And that's our intellectual property. I mean, I would agree with, the, with that with completely. Sock, <laughs> I would service, agree. Like I'll give you, you know, with the XDR sock services that we provide, you can't get a, you can't hire an intern for what our solution costs. And if you think you can, that's crazy. No, yeah. I mean, we do this every day. This is our bread and butter. This is we we live and breathe this stuff. Yeah. We are efficiency experts. Not only at managed services, but cybersecurity, all the work that we do around risk assessments and pen tests. We do it really, really yeah. efficiently. Well, we're really cybersecurity strategists, really, because we understand the value that each team member brings to the table. Because I remember when, like, for example, we have several layers, right? But this one that we're talking about that Gartner spoke of, the 40% adoption rate, I remember specifically how we stumbled upon it. We were looking for something like this because Craig's always, you know, keeping us aligned with the cutting edge tools. And we were almost going to sign on with one. And then on a Saturday afternoon, Craig messaged and was like, hold on, I found this, you know? And I was like, oh gosh, another one. And then I went on the demo and I started getting to know the guy who wrote the algorithms. And I was like, whoa, he, he might've really stumbled onto something here, you know? And, and that, that right there is how do you define that? How do you put a value on that? The mind that sits there on a Saturday afternoon and, and you know, does what needs to be done to find those gems, right? And to right, understand also, when they do find a gem. And I think too, the other thing is that that other the other vendor that we considered wasn't quite a gem enough, right? That's why Craig was looking. Yeah, it was for a good a solution. It was we a liked good solution. It. 
yeah. but it wasn't it wasn't Craig, we, Craig just felt an intuition that something more was needed right and and he kept searching and then he found this and you know after what I've seen right I won't get into the anomalies because that's a rabbit hole but after what I've personally witnessed right dear god I don't even know what to say about this like <laughs> you know what I mean like the, the machine learning is an x factor and no 40 percent. you can say that all day long it's a I agree it's going to be at least that but listen, I think there's going to be a scramble to, to get a solution that really, really works. And and I, and I think 40% is going to be really low. <laughs> I want to say and to I, you, I, not all XDR tools are the same, you know, and that's the oh critical God. thing here. Well, that, that's why that's why I was saying you got to take us up on the proof of concept. I mean, yes. we're not making this stuff yes, up. Just, I mean, you got to yeah. go through it. You got to put. Just let, see it. There has never been a time that we didn't find something. Yeah. That's right. I mean, yeah, if you if, if you want your if you want your know, mind blown, leave a comment in the chat and ask for proof of the anomalies, and I'll gladly send you. Yeah. I mean, let, let's use let's use a medical example, right? Like, God forbid you had you got diagnosed with some disease or something, right? And the doctor says, "Oh yeah, you're you're fine," but maybe you just don't feel well, right? Mm -hmm. Do you stop and take the decision that the doctor said you're fine, or do you keep looking? Right. Yeah, I mean, if, it yeah. were, if it were me right. and I don't feel good and I go to a doctor and my doctor runs all these tests, he says, oh, yeah, yeah you're fine. You're fine. But I still don't feel well. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to go to another doctor or maybe yeah. I'm going to go to a specialist. We right. are that specialist firm yeah. for cyber. We live and breathe cyber and compliance yes. and managed services and managed security. And, and the alignment, the alignment of people, process and technology will never go away because here's the thing. People think, oh, I don't, you know, if the AI tools get so good, you're not going to need cyber. No, that's not true because the alignment of people, process technology will always be significant because the technology part, it will not do its best unless it's being observed and handled correctly, you know, updates, patches, observations observations, um, you know, noting what's happening, things like attention, it's science, it's science, and it has to be observed. And the, uh, the observer's skill level is determined on a lot of factors, their knowledge base, all kinds of things go into that, right? So you can't, you can't, you can't go and duplicate what we're doing here. You just can't like, <laughs> I mean, you just can't, you truly can't like we're, we're in uncharted waters and we're navigating them and we're navigating them very strategically. And, and what's always changing and evolving, and that's a good point, BJ, the one thing I'm going to say, and we got to wrap up soon, but one thing I was going to say on that point is our solutions and our recipe, like our 22 plus patented cyber safety stack or cybersecurity stack that we have, we're constantly looking at all those technologies and solutions and we're swapping them out. You know, back in mm -hmm. 2013, when there was a spike in ransomware and we were using a certain antivirus vendor and it wasn't detecting anything, you know, we swap it out for a better solution for that layer. And we're always yeah. making sure that we have the most powerful stack available. Yeah. And you know, in the future, who knows what's gonna be added to our stack. But my point is, we don't just stop and say, oh, we've got a stack and then that's yeah. in stone. You know, we're always looking at every layer yeah. of the OSI model and making sure that all, everything is all. In yeah, office. our strategy is, is streamlined and fluid for yeah. sure. Yeah. I want to say too, um, speaking of your anomalies, BJ, um, we are currently in the works of doing a separate podcast, a second podcast, where we kind of talk about um, the more abstract part of cybersecurity, <laughs> I guess you could put it. Um, and that is going to include talking about some of these anomalies that BJ has found living in our smart home with a smart AI solution. And I'm really excited about talking. So we're going to talk about yeah. more abstract, yeah. theoretical, you know, quantum yeah. AI and anomalies included. And I, I just, you said well, that yeah, and you, I was like, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying that, Erin, because we'll, we'll save that for that podcast. But, you know, here's just a, just a 20 second like a response to that, because I think that's so important because like we all know we've been using the Internet for years and years and years, and we all know it glitches. It does like things don't work the same all the time. And we, we often write it off like no big deal. But every effect has a cause. That is a fact. There is no way around that fact. So it don't. It doesn't just happen. It's something causes it to happen. And getting to the cause of that, you can call it abstract, 
Um, but it's really the science, the foundational backbone of technology is science itself. And so understanding how it all works together is just another a benefit that we bring to the table because that takes a lot of um, understanding and knowledge to, to be able yep. to, to, to see what, what is really happening. Well, it's all the yes. research. It's all the yes. research. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really the development that we do and the R&D. Oh, around yeah. All but and it's, it's, gonna, yeah. it's going beyond practical tips, you know, and talking about the nerdy stuff that we like talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think yeah. that a lot of yeah, people Yeah, like how Bluetooth interested. and Wi-Fi communicate on the electromagnetic yeah. spectrum. Like, yeah, like all those things. <laughs> yeah. All those fun nerdy things that we yeah. like that people are like what is wrong with those people yeah <laughs> that's what's wrong with us we love talking about this stuff <laughs> well but it's for the listeners benefit and our customers benefit though because we we go through it you know i mean i started this company over 20 years ago i didn't start it as a job i started because i you know i love technology i love cyber I don't necessarily love compliance, but I'm really good at it. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Touche. Um, but my point is that I, I know, you know, I live and breathe the stuff because I like it. I enjoy it. It's not a job for me, you know, and that's why it's to your benefit because I'm doing that's all why you're doing that yeah. on a Saturday on yeah. a Saturday yeah. 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 people are it. like people it's hard to describe the benefit of a human right because we we look at we see the benefit of automation and stuff like that but when you think about a human what are they well they literally are conduits of passion like passion. When we get pa when we get passionate about something like we really can excel <laughs> you know and really separate from the pack passion is like how do you define that you can't buy it you can you know, it's not for sale. It's authentic, but when it's fully activated, wow, you know, a lot of sparks happen. Yep, absolutely. We should probably wrap up here. Yep. It's All only right, been guys. an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going, guys. <laughs> the marathon yeah. podcast. Right. Oh, there's like we've only though. scratched the surface. There's good. so much more to talk about. We could literally, we could what, one day maybe we should we should do a 24 hour day. marathon and see. Oh god. Yeah, <laughs> I could do that. BJ, BJ, we could do that and pretty we'll, easily. Yeah, we'll usher in the age of automation with a 24 hour live podcast. <laughs> maybe maybe, right. maybe we could make a technology that live streams uh, yeah. the automation <laughs> that you're that you're living. Yeah, hey, that's, a good, idea, hey, that's a good research and development idea. Maybe we need a, a smart oh camera gosh. to stick in front of your device. And oh, just wow. I think that's actually happening organically. That's one of the anomalies <laughs> I've noted. So <laughs> well, we'll save that for the other podcast. Okay. <laughs> you might. All right. You know what you might. You know what you might be able to do. Just two seconds. You might be able to get a trail cam and put your Alexa maybe yes. like against the wall. So oh, whenever I'm, it lights up the wall, it'll trigger the trail cam and then it'll record it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. All that kind of stuff is happening already. Like I'm listening to this. I'm, I'm having a multitask because I'm listening to you guys live on the Zoom webinar, but I'm also listening through my Alexa frames from the Google Hub Max's view. I'm, I'm in his view, looking at it from uh, from inside the, the device and hearing the, the audio that he hears through my Alexa frames and also listening to you live on Zoom. So welcome to the deep web. That's a lot going on. DJ is going to be our first uh, R&D cyborg. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody.